Yes, we have that. Uh, welcome. Oops, I'm losing my. <laughs> no, no, no. It's work. It worked the other way around because in the other room the light was on when it was off, so it's on. And now the light is off again. Okay, um, so it's on. Welcome to, to this session on uh, IS3C's presentation on uh, procurement, government procurement and supply chain management. Um, what you saw online almost doesn't exist anymore in the invitation because the people there are not here and not able to, pre to be present online. So we changed it around a little bit, but not, not a lot. Um, my name is Walter Natris and I am the coordinator of the IGF Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security and Safety Coalition, IS3C. And we've been around since the virtual IGF of 2020. We announced an idea there, and then we had to find people, funding, etc., cetera, to, uh, to uh, start working. On my left side is our senior policy advisor, Mark Ravel. He is on our online moderator today. And on my right side is David Huberman of ICANN, and together with Bastian Goslin sitting there, they're the chair and vice chair of our working group on uh, DNSSEC and RPKI deployment. And why that is relevant, we'll explain in a little while. Um, when we got to 2021 in Katowice, we were able to present a real plan. We introduced three working groups, one on IoT security by design, one on procurement and supply chain management, and one on education and skills. In 2022, in Addis, uh, we presented our first report by the Education and Skills Working Group, which is having their session right now, which I had to run out of uh, to moderate two sessions at the same time, which, as you see, is impossible. Luckily, the chair of Education Skills, Janice Richardson, took over. What you can see, what as I3C we try to do, we do, don't try just to produce a report or an idea. We want to try to translate it into actions and to something tangible. And that is in line with what the Secretary General of the UN is striving for to m have the IGF come up with tangible outcomes. In that room, right now, room E, the idea of a cybersecurity hub is introduced. It's again, a concept, an idea, it doesn't exist yet. But the idea is to, in that hub, translate the outcomes of the education and skills working group into something that universities and industry together could start working on to make sure that the knowledge gap between supply and demand in education is somehow solved. So that is what is happening today here as well at the IGF. We are here for a different reason. I'll put on my glasses to be able to read a little bit. Um, this is on procurement. And why procurement? In the first place, because in our opinion, when we talk about cybersecurity, you always see that it's about mitigation. It's always about having to buy antivirus, something to have a firewall installed, to have a cybersecurity institute, a C-CERT or a CERT, as a government or a big organization, but that is all after you got into trouble. The internet runs on internet standards created by the technical community. And these standards were created somewhere in the late 1960s up to, let's say, 2000. And in that time period, it was not necessary to think about security. And that's literally what Vint Cerf says nowadays. If we had known where this beast would go to, based on something they created in 1972, then we would have done it differently. Well, we discussed it for about two seconds, and then thought, well, we know everybody who's connected, so why do we need security? And 20 years later, slowly but surely, the whole world started to come online. And we all know what sort of problems we run into. But David will tell you about that more eloquently than I could ever do in English, and even with the knowledge I have compared to what he has. So why procurement? If governments would start procuring secure by design, it would mean that they would demand these internet standards to be in place when they buy, when they buy software that it's 
tested software and not something that just comes off a shelf without knowing what it is. When you buy, uh, create a website that you, uh, you create it, you build it according to the latest standards of security and not something that has holes in it all over. So on procurement, we started this working group in 2020, the idea, and to my surprise, we found that there's very little interest. We couldn't find the funding, we couldn't find the people, except one person said, I want to chair this. And she wrote a whole program and we had to wait for two years until we found funding from the RIPE organization, the RIPE uh, community fund. And that research started this year in January, February, and we're able to present our report here at the IGF on Tuesday. So the research done by Mallory Nodal and Liz Rembo, who are supposed to be here, but could not be here because they're traveling. But what it shows, the, this research, is that there's li very little publicly available procurement documents online. I think they found 11 from, the, from 11 countries. We asked around and found three more. We could not find anything in the public sector. And we asked thousands of people, could you share, even if it's anonymized, something with us so that we can do a global study. So if it's not there, and that's the caveat we have to make, is that is it because there is nothing or is it because it's behind bars somewhere but nobody's allowed to look at? But the ones that we could study shows an awful lot. Most of them don't mention security in any way. When they mention security, it's not cybersecurity. And if it's cybersecurity, then it's not about these sort of standards, but on the mitigation side and not on the prevention side. We have one exception that we found in the boom. That is Annemieke there. The Dutch government has a procurement list of, I think, 46 or 43 standards that are all but mandatory to deploy. And that's the only one that we could find in the whole world. The Dutch government also developed something called internet.nl, which allows you to check if your organization or another organization has any security in place for the domain name, for routing, for etc. So that, that is what the situation is. The, the report will be presented on, on, Tuesday, on Tuesday in our own dynamic coalition session and an open forum again with the forum standardization from the Netherlands on, on Thursday. So we have found very little documents on government procurement and none from the private sector. So can we draw very firm conclusions? The answer is no, because perhaps there is a lot more in the world, just not we're not able to access it. But can we some draw some conclusions anyway? And I think that the answer is yes, we can. Because it's quite obvious, as I said, that internet standards are not recognized. And I think that that is something that is important to understand. The internet runs on internet standards. And if we talk about the public core of the internet and defending the public core of the internet, then it's not only about the physical cables, but also on the standards that make that internet run. And if they're allowed to be attacked 24 hours a day by everybody who feels like attacking it and abusing it and misusing it, then it is a question why are governments not recognizing these open standards in one way or another. So I think that that is an important conclusion that despite discussions on defending the public core, that public core is not recognized for what it is. So how do we make sure that that happens? I think that there is, in other words, a, a world of secu security to win for everybody. But we have to stop talking about prevention only, or sorry, about mitigation only. We have to start talking about prevention. And the fastest way to do that, in our opinion, is procurement. But then the next step is how do we convince people in decision-taking positions to actually procure secure by design. 
and actually renegotiate a contract at the moment that re renegotiates your job, that you bring in these sort of standards. And that is one of the working groups that we have are starting this year, and it's called DNS Sec and RPKI deployment. But it goes in the end for, for everything on internet standards. But we took two examples. But we don't start talking about it in the way that is being spoken about for about 20 years. We're going to try to change the narrative. And I think that, that I will give the microphone to David in a few minutes. What we'd like from this session is that I've said about everything that I wanted to say about this topic. What we'd like to learn from you is what is your experience, what are your ideas, what would you, how could you contribute to this discussion? And from there, see what we can go home with. As I said, we're introducing this concept of a cybersecurity hub. How can we actually activate it? How can we make sure the right people start working together there from the different stakeholder groups and come up with tangible ideas that are translatable either in direct programs or in, in capacity building programs or whatever we like to call it. But the fact is that something needs to change because it's the discussion is running in the same direction for a long, long time without very noticeable changes. So how to convince decision takers by design? And I think that that is the starting point of our working group on DNSSEC and RPKI deployment. So David, I'm going to hand over to you right now to explain what your plans are. Thank you, Al. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Huberman, and I'm with ICANN. When one of the things we're trying to get people to understand is when they pick up their device and they watch a TikTok video or they send an email or even if they're involved in a chat, a group chat or on uh, WhatsApp or Line or just SMS, a lot of people think, well, that's the Internet. But it's not. Those are applications on the Internet. In fact, they run on a whole system of routers and servers and switches and firewalls, all of which are the underlying framework that we use these applications. The, this system of framework, however, is built on common protocols. And there are two protocols that stand as the foundation for almost all of the modern Internet. One of them is called BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, and it's the system of routing, how networks talk to each other. And the other is the DNS, the domain name system, which is used as a backbone of communication so that we can use semantic names that we as humans understand to translate into the IP addresses that computers understand. Now, as Wout noted in his conversation with Vint Cerf, BGP and DNS are very old protocols. BGP was, f the version we're using now, was standardized in 1995. And DNS is even older than that. It comes from November 1983. It's going to turn 40 years old next month. And when we developed these protocols, the intention was to get them just to work. We just wanted to be able to push packets to and from networks. Did you get it? Did it come back? Yay, it worked. And what's nice about these protocols is they scale. The reason we're still using them 30 and 40 years later is because they scale infinitely. But as Wout noted, they weren't built with security in mind whatsoever. So over the last 20 years, what the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, has been doing has been redeveloping these, bolting on security. And for BGP, one of the primary drivers today of, of routing security is a new system called RPKI, Routing Public Key Infrastructure. And essentially, it allows providers to talk to each other but authenticate the origins of routing information. This has a lot of benefits. It benefits us against malicious hijacks of routes. It benefits against accidental misconfigurations. And hopefully it can um, help prevent IP spoofing and other things that attackers use to do bad things. DNS 
has a similar suite of security tools that we call DNSSEC. And DNSSEC is very important because when you go to a website, when you go to www.un.org, we want to ensure that the data that you receive back is actually the data that the people who run un.org intended you to have. So DNSSEC allows for, uh, to, you to assure the integrity of the DNS queries and the data that you're receiving back. These security enhancements to these two fundamental protocols can significantly increase the security posture of the entire Internet ecosystem for all users in the world. But yet, the adoption of DNSSEC is at about 25% of all the domain names. And RPKI, while it enjoys much fuller deployment, especially in the ISPs around the world, we're still working on increasing the deployment to all of the networks that participate in the global routing system to get them to digitally sign their routes so that everybody else can validate them. So how do we increase penetration? How do we increase this deployment? This is what one of the newest working groups of IS3C is working on. We've put together a panel of world-class experts and we are developing a new narrative that we're going to test against decision makers at ISPs, decision makers in public policy, and decision makers in network operations to help motivate them to increase the deployment of these very secure protocols that in 2023 ought to be a baseline standard that everybody adopts. Uh, thank you, David. Um, perhaps, Anamiek, that you would like to say in a few lines what exactly is what the Dutch government is doing. Excuse me, we start all over again. <laughs> the Dutch government is using a comply or explain list uh, for uh, ICT services. And on that list, there are about 40 standards, open standards, including general standards, but also specific 15, for instance, uh, internet safety standards. They should be used in ICT services. And we have a process of organizing that, that means um, uh, uh, yeah, um, maintainers can um, uh, can tell which standard should be on that list, and we organize with experts from all uh, Netherlands um, uh, to see which standard should be on that list. And um, those open standards are uh, uh, yeah, mandated; huh? they are mandated. And we suggest them. So we cannot, um, how do you say that, uh, give penalties if they don't use them. But we just suggest those standards. And if they use them uh, in their services, we name them. And so we're not shaming them, but we're naming them uh, in order to uh, adopt standards uh, more positively, <laughs> more increasingly. Uh, besides that, comply or explain list, we monitor. So we're monitoring uh, those standards, especially in procurement. And so all the tenders in Holland, in the Netherlands, we do for ICT services uh, by the government. We um, research, we have researched. And um, if there are any standards uh, not used in the procurement, uh, in the tender, then um, yeah, they should uh, explain that in their annual report. Um, yeah, monitoring uh, is very positive for adoption of open standards because uh, twice a year we monitor the special s uh, internet safety standards and we offer that to the 
parliament, actually. <laughs> we, at first, it goes to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And we say, oh, are you doing well? Are you doing not so well? You have to increase. And we use the tool Wout mentioned, uh, internet.nl, which is very sufficient to measure this. And um, to, uh, yeah, we public the figures. So it's more like uh, naming and a little bit of shaming. <laughs> Um, and in addition, we have a co yeah, community, we encourage community, so we uh, use this internet.nl tool in order to get in the discussion with large suppliers, for instance Microsoft, uh, using Dane, um, the open standard Dane. In uh, the Netherlands, w <laughs> it turns out that uh, it's not uh, used, uh, you as you know, as you might know. And in discussion with Microsoft, we, uh, for instance, uh, that's one of the suppliers, we uh, found out that they are open for discussion and uh, they will change their um, yeah, uh, email server with Dane. Uh, and that is a very nice uh, uh, announcement. Coming year, they will also uh, uh, do the fully Dane uh, 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 execution, I uh, understood. So, therefore, we use internet.nl for a community and uh, getting cooperation, cooperation with other suppliers. And that is very nice uh, to have. So, that are the three points. Uh, mandate, um, monitoring and uh, community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anamika. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Because <laughs> but uh, I think it's a nice explanation what you hear. And if you are online and you go to internet.nl, just type in any domain name that you can think of and you will see the results popping up within a few seconds. Uh, David wants to respond first. Uh, thank you. So what the Dutch government do is doing with this is exemplar of a really nice way for government and public policy to integrate with the world of internet standards, which is primarily an engineering-based um, endeavor. Um, it's interesting, we are here today, those of us in the room are here in Kyoto. And for those of us who aren't from this beautiful country, there's something we all have in common right now. We all have brought along with us these little travel adapters that we use when we want to charge our devices. Why? Because the shape and the voltages of the plugs in Japan are not the same as the shape or the voltages that we use in our home country. And why is that? Because we have a set of standards for some countries and a different set of standards for other countries and other standards for other countries. We have lots of standards, but no global standard. Uh, in my wallet right now, you'll find Japanese yen, you'll find euros, and you'll find American dollars. But it's funny because they all do the same thing. I hand them over to someone when I want to buy something from them. The purpose of currency in 2023 is very straightforward. I give, you sell, I give. It's the same purpose around the world, but we use different currency. In Japan, we drive on the left side of the road and our steering wheel is on the right side of the car. In other countries, we drive on the right side of the road with the steering wheel on the left side of the car. That's not only challenging for those of us as drivers, it's also challenging for the manufacturers of those vehicles because they have to have a whole different set of standards for safety and for operation when the steering wheel is on a different side of the car. Internet standards don't work like that. Internet standards from the beginning, from 1969 with RFC 1 through today in 2023, we have almost 10,000 published standards. Internet standards are intended to be fully interoperable all around the world, whether you're in China, whether in Kenya, whether you're in Paraguay, whether you're in Iceland, no matter where you are in the world, if you're online on the Internet, we're all using the same standards. And that's really important because it allows for a fully interoperable, fully global internet that in itself enables innovation. It's because it works everywhere 
that people are able to develop applications and platforms and do amazing things because it works the same way no matter where you are. And this is where the Dutch government, and this is where other governments can really show leadership because in the development of those standards, it's 2023. The Internet's everywhere in the world. It's not 1969 anymore. We can't develop these in a vacuum. We can't just develop these as pure engineering exercises. Instead, we have to think about the real-world implications of new technologies, the implications of new protocol and protocol development. And so strongly, are, here at IGF this week, strongly encouraging governments, parliamentarians, public policy, civil society to become involved in Internet standards development to offer your expertise to the, to the development process, while at the same time understanding and respecting that so much of what we've created is due to it being an engineering-driven endeavor and the engineers are the true experts in how to do this. So it, it, it's a real commendation. It speaks very well of the Dutch government. Internet.nl is a wonderful site that works really well, having the, help, helping your organization understand where you sit in this world of standards. And that's about what I wanted to share. Well, thank you, David. We'll just pause for a second. <laughs> So thank you very much. I think that from this side of the table, that is what we wanted to share with you. So I think you now understand what the IS3C is about, what we try to achieve, but also what we try to achieve in the near future. From now, we would like to learn from you what, how does this concept come across? As a, does it make sense? What we'd like to know also is do you know about any of the procurement schemes in your country, of your organization? But also to dis discuss a little the plans that, that David, with, together with Bastian, has to change the narrative of, of how to convince people in leadership to really think about cybersecurity up front and not as an issue that pops up after you bought something. So the mic is there in the middle of the room. The, I can also pass a mic around. Th I think the first question is, what, you've heard this, how does it come across? What do you think of this plan? Does it make sense? Would you do it different yourself? Just anything that you'd like to share of us what we can learn from. So the microphone is there. Uh, just introduce yourself first, please, and then just share, share your thoughts with us. Please. Hi, y'all. I, I, okay, it's on, perfect. Um, Viet Vu from Toronto Metropolitan University in Toronto, Canada. Um, this is actually opportune timing because literally about two weeks ago, um, I just published a paper on Canadian government's digital adoption. Um, and a couple of things on how that lands, um, what we've discussed so far. The first thing is that the incredible thing about the Canadian government is that not only is there no standard in, in procurement that isn't a single set of standards that the same government department uses. And the problem even becomes more complex when you go down to the provincial, which is the second level of governance in Canada. It goes federal and provincial. Um, think of US states or, or prefectures um, in Japan. Um, each of them actually has their own legislation that governs privacy, that governs digital communications. Um, and so that creates a challenge. Now, in terms of what we think might work, or, or, or the keeper that has prevented, let's say, the conversation of digital to sort of surface to the top, it is very much just the fact that there really isn't anyone who's actually empowered to raise those issues. Um, the Canadian government recently created Canadian Digital Services, which was this like out of government um, group that is there to deliver government services in house, kind of. They're the first time that the government has done so, but um, at the, the assistant deputy minister level, which is sort of the minister, deputy minister, and assistant deputy minister, that's why you kind of need the, 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 the people who are kind of empowered to raise the issue of digital, and just, there just isn't any. Um, and so the, if in terms of Canadian context, the one person you probably want to talk to is a senator, um, Colin Deacon. He's been sort of spearheading a lot of legislative framework. Um, I can put you in contact with them after the session if you, that's of interest. So, just a, perhaps a short follow-up question. Um, 
how has your report landed? Have you got any any response from a government side, or is it still you know yeah, I mean university? It's, it's a great question. The, the the it landed really well actually. We did like a, I did like a couple of like radio rounds literally before boarding the plane to Kyoto. I was 9 a.m. I was actually giving a panel talk on the topic, um, and then 3 p.m. I was on my flight here. Once I'm back in, in November, we're actually delivering a workshop to sort of high-level decision makers. So we're talking deputy minister, assistant deputy minister, and director generals within those three hierarchies um, in Ottawa in November, on particularly on, on thinking about policy solutions. So we know that the general topic lands well right now with them. Well, uh, con congratulations, and I think your your invitation to 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 introduce us, I think that that is would be very much welcome. Thank you. Any other ideas in the room? How this lands, Bastian, the, uh, and the lady there. Yeah, so you can stand in line. <laughs> Hello, my name is Gunnela Asprink, uh, chairing the Internet Society Accessibility Standing Group. And accessibility in, in this respect uh, talks about accessibility for persons with disability. And uh, we, we know that there's a number of countries uh, who have looked at um, public procurement uh, for accessible uh, digital goods and services. And uh, there are standards in the US and in the EU and that have been adopted in countries like Australia and India and Kenya. And then it's, uh, of course, this common issue of implementation. So I was very interested in the Dutch initiative. Uh, and, uh, and we found in Australia, for example, that when it comes to web accessibility and procurement by governments, uh, there, there was a monitoring system and, uh, and then uh, uh, it uh, there wasn't funding enough to continue it, and uh, that's what we're hoping that other other countries and uh, and systems will be able to continue that uh, that type of implementation of a policy. And I should also mention here that in the EU there's an Accessibility Act, which will which is going to be a directive for all EU countries to ensure that. Um, any supplier to, to a European country should have um, uh, accessibility built in to the, those digital products. And, uh, and th that, that's supposed to be mandatory. So we will see how those sort of systems work and it will be very interesting to see how that intersects with what we're talking about here today. Thank you. That's uh, also interesting because in uh, Holland and the Netherlands we also uh, develop uh, dashboards, including internet.nl for accessibility purposes. So uh, follow the Dutch uh, government in that way and uh, <laughs> you might be using uh, also the dashboard in, in future. And internet.nl is integrated into the dashboard. So nice hearing. <laughs> No, no, no problem at all. I have a question for you, actually. Um, Bastian Goslings uh, from the RIPE NCC, um, together with ICANN, uh, working in a new working group um, to improve, you know, the, to see to it that uh, adoption of techniques like a, a DNSSEC and RPKI is uh, moved uh, forward. And I'm really happy, you know, with, uh, I'm Dutch, so maybe I'm prejudiced, but I'm really happy and even proud, you know, of what the Dutch public authorities and government is doing here. So all kudos to the Dutch stand, uh, Forum for Standardization. I just uh, wondered, um, Annemiek, maybe you, you can share more there, um, in terms of what the Dutch are doing, right, and the policies that are underlying this, and the reasons why you guys uh, set the list uh, for comply or, uh, or comply with or explain or even mandating, you know, the usage of certain tools. Is there information with regard, you know, to the underlying policies available in English? And do you have any experiences, you know, talking with other 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 governments, other similar agencies like yours? You know, is, is this being taken up, this idea? How do other people respond to this? Um, you mean other governments in Europe or, for instance? For instance. Because uh, Denmark mm -hmm. is also uh, using dot inter of internet .nl for their own uh, policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately also Australia and um, Brazil using the internet .nl. 
in their uh, policy. So that might be, uh, they ha have a different uh, uh, attitude to it, but yes. Um, and you ask uh, what kind of policy is behind the comply yes, or uh, explain I, I think, you know, I'm aware that, um, as far as I know, at least internet.nl, the underlying uh, software is open source, right? Yes, and correct. People can, of course, adapt yep. their own front end in their own uh, language, right? Yep. To use a similar server, so that's all great. But I, I really mean more in terms of the underlying policies in terms of, of uh, techniques, tools, standards that, in this case, Dutch public authorities need to comply with because um. you think it's important for certain reasons, right? Uh, you need to be reachable over IPv6 or your, your website needs to be reachable over IPv6. Uh, when you uh, purchase certain um, online services, cloud, or whatever, it needs to have RPKI implemented, stuff like that, right? Like the, the reason why you think that's necessary to actually demand that in terms of procuring services or having public authorities comply with these type of... Um, you Standard. go very fast, also <laughs> for me, I guess, but <laughs> also <laughs> for the audience. But um, well, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, government uh, uh, promotes also use IPv6 mm -hmm. and IPv6, uh, 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 IPv6. Um, and the policy. Yeah, I, I don't know actually what you mean, but the policy behind it, because what we do is. Uh, we stimulate the adoption of those standards mm -hmm. in order to, uh, uh, to, to give practical um, experience in the field to show that it works. Mm -hmm. So we, we, uh, we, we have a carrot, let me say it like that, mm -hmm. and people have to hung chunk to it yeah. in order to use it because in the, in the field, you, uh, the society has advantage of it. Uh, but I don't know. Um, I do not no, understand I, I totally the, the policy that behind. Uh, what well, maybe it makes it so obvious that you don't have a policy behind it, right? You just think it's a good thing to do. <laughs> uh, other other countries, for instance, are not doing it. So I wondered: is there anything that you can share or help to convince them that, hey, in terms of procuring services, it would also be good, you know, to set certain requirements with standards you would have to comply with? Yeah. Well, if if tenders uh, are committed uh, mm -hmm. or uh, executed then uh, they follow in Holland a an, uh, an special tender website and there are CPV codes included in order to uh, support people uh, in procurement uh, departments to uh, request for open standards. And um, in addition, we explain what the standards are because mo most of the people in procurement, they, they are not technical. So we suggest uh, talk to your architecture or to uh, other colleagues in your company and um, get to know what technically involvement is for, for, for uh, the execution because uh, the, the, the procurement department doesn't know anything about ICT and the technical things, but they know the consequences of it, mm -hmm. uh, or, or the business knows. So talk to the business, uh, the consequences, and then you know what kind of standards you need. Uh, lately I had a colleague uh, of uh, safety, yeah, some uh, space control, and they he didn't understand actually what uh, the consequence w was of not using open standards for internet uh, safety standards. And I was amazed, like, huh? what are you doing? Yeah, but I don't want to tender them because then I, I don't have any suppliers who can offer these services. And so the developers, we, uh, yeah, we don't mm -hmm. have offers. But I suggest him get in touch with the suppliers in order to uh, explain what open standards can do for you and for us because you are obliged to, you to, be, uh, to give services to the uh, civilians uh, which are secured and safe. And he was like, yeah, but uh, yeah, but that is uh, difficult, too difficult. Uh, I, I was amazed because you have, if you s uh, offer services as a government, yeah, you have to protect the users of uh, the services. It's amazing. <laughs> but well, Th that's no, not no, your you question. You to a large, to a large extent, you did at least the intention, right? And I, th I think it's really great that you guys are that you are here, yeah, right? In, or in order to explain and to give people more insight into what the Dutch are doing here. So uh, thanks for that. Well, we yeah. stimulate the adoption as much as possible. So we get pe uh, various organizations in contact with each other. That's what we do. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a very good example when you heard about the space agency that uh, a few years ago, just before the whole pandemic started, I was invited to give a presentation to the Marine Officer Club of the Netherlands on cybersecurity. 
together with a few other people. And I asked them a very simple question. Have you ever done a cyber alert practice something? Because they will do it for when an animal attacks. They will do it for the fire on board of the ships. They will do it for whatever. And they were all looking at me like, what are you talking about? A cyber exercise? <laughs> I said, okay, let's take the example of one ship. How many connections to the outside world will be on that ship without probably you ever being aware of them? Because in a car, they're, all or they're over 100. That's yeah, what I always say, just like the E.T., if any of you saw the movie, E.T. phones home. Well, that car is phoning home the whole day to, to whatever is going on in the engine or the brakes or whatever is being monitored nowadays. So in other words, it is a very, very relevant question to ask from your suppliers, am I actually secure? And if not, how are you going to make sure that I am? So that is an excellent example. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else who would like to respond on this plan? Is what do you? How does it come across? Because some people will have heard it for the first time now. So how how do you think that this could work? I see people deep in thought. So I think that we've exhausted that question. Thank you for the people that have re responded. Um, the second question, and we had already one answer was the, the on, on Canada. From what, what countries are you? Because we know the Dutch from what country are, are you? Indonesia. Indonesia. And you? Japan. And Japan? Yes, thank you. Yeah. The gentleman totally in the back, from what country are you? Japan, Japan thank you. You're from Australia, I think, yes? Japan. Japan. The US. The US, okay. So we have from a few uh, countries, from a few, through a few uh, continents. Are any of you aware of any procurement action in your country so either from government or industry that actually procure cyber secure by design yes um, ooh, way too tall now um, <laughs> so there is one in Canada right now and so um, the the background to this is that Canada is kind of an oligopolistic country. Um, it's, it's ran, the three main industry all have like a couple of really big companies that kind of work together. Um, and within banking, what they have sort of actually created a kind of a common standard, um, particularly in, in bank transfers, um, that allows people to send monies through sending emails to each other. And that system is called Interact. And they've actually created a, 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 a a couple of years ago, they became what's called a sign-in partner. And so whenever a, a Canadian citizen um, or anyone who's interacting with the Canadian government is trying to log in to access, let's say, tax services, immigration services, social welfare services, they can actually use the exact same login as they use for their banking account in order to log into the service. And so they sort of integrated the, the, the identification of those. And what happened recently, just last year, is that um, Intrac formed a strategic partnership with a company called Secure Key, I think is the name. And so that is sort of the company, um, in my understanding, that does um, digital verification and digital identity verification. And the plan right now is to figure out working with the Canadian government. And the Canadian government is basically in the form of procurement to introduce Secure Key to that already existing sort of signed in partner system. So. Thank you. So that's going to be a very, very interesting company to attack if they can literally do the security for everybody. So uh, the, uh, the security by design is going to be tremendously important there. Uh, thank you. Any other examples? Then thank you for that. Um, the other question that I have is that um, you've heard about David and Bastian leading the working group on the narrative. So if you look at what has happened in the past years, 
all the presentations I saw on DNS sec procurement, uh, sorry, uh, the deployment, IPv6 deployment or RPKI deployment, I've been to several over the past 10 years. It was always about technical education. The people in a company or organization have to know how they do this in a technical way and then everybody goes home after they had this technical training. But the numbers adding up to from the training to the de actual deployment did not match. So people follow a training, but it doesn't mean that the company deployed IP version 6 or DNSSEC or RPKI. In the Netherlands, what the .nl registry did is they said if you sign DNSSEC, then you will get a discount on your annual, on your annual uh, fee that you have to pay to have that domain name. And that actually led to a significant ri r rise in DNSSEC in the Netherlands. So they got a, a within a year above 50% because they were offered, I don't know, 10 or 20 cents discount on their annual fee. But if you have a lot of domain names, then it becomes a lot of money, not if you only have one domain name. So that was an example how numbers were raised in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, but when you talk about decision takers, they will probably not decide on these, this 20 cent, but perhaps they do. But what could be arguments that are non-technical why a senior person in a company or a government decides, yes, this is a smart thing to do, we're going to deploy DNSSEC. Would you have any ideas for us that we could use in our advisory panel to take forward when we produce our outcome probably early next year? Do you have any experience here? I see you raise your, finger, your hand. <laughs> no? Now it works, I think. Now it works? Yes. Well, RIPE assisted us to give discount on IPv6 uh, uh, courses. So what we did is uh, forum uh, standardization is... Uh, we uh, requested uh, policy makers uh, in Holland to join courses of RIPE and they got discount from us in order to follow these courses. That might be also an interesting adoption uh, way. So, a suggestion. David, um, Bastian, you decided to sponsor this this working group as well, besides leading it. Um, what makes it so different for you to actually try and come up with a different narrative? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, you touched on it a lot a few moments ago when you talked about uh, the technical education and how working. we've worked really hard as an organization to build capacity on the importance of DNSSEC and then how to actually do it. A lot of my colleagues go around the world and speak with groups of engineers who operate networks and will do on will actually do DNSSEC signing online real on their computers that's in the live environment and teach them all the skills they need to continue maintaining it. But that's not enough because it reaches a small group of operators and while it helps them it doesn't it's it's so much more challenging to get that message out to the much larger world for all the domain owners uh, and for all the operators of recursive resolvers who have to do the DNSSEC validation so we're we're really looking at this initiative as a way of as we've said a few times today change the narrative find a new way of saying it and test it against decision makers and say, how does this strike you? Does this persuade you? And based on their feedback, then we can iterate again and refine it even further. And so that's our interest in why we want to fund this and why we're really uh, engaged and motivated here.
Yeah, thank you. Um, as a regional internet uh, registry, uh, we're a non-profit organization. Um, like it's part of our mission to, to increase the trust and the rel reliability of, of the internet. And not only talking about topics like fragmentation and other things you know, that are potentially detrimental and could have a serious effect, but even the internet as is, right? It was referred to that um, DNS and the routing part, they're not directly visible. Maybe it's the DNS eh, names people are familiar with, but the routing part for most people, that's not something they are aware of, need to be aware of. But these are fundamental to everything else that depends on it, that runs on top of it. So the security there, it's almost unfortunate, right, that the incidents that happen, and quite a few happen, that they're not visible in terms of actual impact that people experience and that, that acts as a wake-up call. Um, so at the end of the day, if we want to remain, uh, keep people's trust in the entire system, right, and that it also is going to increase, then something has to be done. I think it's really, really great what, for instance, the Dutch government is doing, right? Lead by example, but there might even come a point, especially if you see in the European Union, the amount of legislation affecting the, uh, the infrastructure and the ecosystem is enormous. If at some point the perception will really be there that this is a market failure and people are not getting their act together, then it will be regulated. And we have all the tools available, everything available to do it ourselves, right? Technically, the standards have been there for a long time. All the, the tools used, for instance, to, to um, on the one hand, do the author authorization part with us uh, to actually sign your IP addresses and associate them with uh, an autonomous system number, right? Who is actually allowed to ori ori origin a certain prefix? That is a very like easy portal to use. On the other hand, the validating part, the software that you actually use to check the announcements you receive to see if whether they're valid or not. Um, that's actually, you know, in a, at a very uh, mature state. So everything is there. So why is it not being picked up? I think in terms of um, the originating part, like people signing uh, resources, I think we're like 40% globally, and then it really differs, you know, per, per region or per country, which is good, but we need to step up here. And people think it's either really, really technical, complex to implement, and I understand if you have a huge network with an enormous amount of routers, you know, and others that you depend on and, and customers you have, I'm not saying it's trivial, but for an average network or engineer who takes her or his job seriously, it's, 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 not, it's not that much of a, of a challenge. People think it's really expensive to implement. Well, certainly with a project, there are costs involved. But if it's about eh, the underlying, what your services, eh, how people experience your online services, mo more and more services are provided online, how people actually you know, experience those, this is fundamental, right? That people need to know that if I tr aim to contact someone or, or try to uh, reach certain content, that I'm actually reaching you know, the place I want to be at. It seems a given, but Looking again, as was mentioned, the protocols are ancient and this needs to be uh, improved. So I think we have um, work there to do to actually gain the stories, right? And to actually convince people, hey, this is not so hard. And there are so many material available. Like uh, Amit just said, we provide courses to people. We do it, everything is available free online. But if you really want like a face-to-face -face training with a trainer, et cetera, normally there are costs involved, but we can, organize uh, stuff. We've been a really effective, especially in the Middle Eastern uh, region, to get people in a room. So both the regulators, the operators, and you know, just go through the whole thing and ha actually have people sign resources. And then you, especially if you have only maybe one incumbent or like two operators in a country, if people start signing their resources, you see an enormous uptake in adoption. And we do the same at peering for our other or meetings we organize. We have like ROA signing parties. We get people in a room, right, and actually demonstrate how relatively trivial it is, especially for network engineers, to sign their resources and to, to look at the validation part. So we're actually doing a lot there. And I really hope, you know, in terms of audience and, and, and storyline narrative that we can also have an impact combined with all the other stuff that we're doing here um, at the IGF. Yeah, thank you. But, but Bastian, David, the internet works, everything works. It, it's playing advocate, uh, devil's advocate here. Everything works, it's on the whole day. There's no failure, so why should I ever do something? Why should I invest in security? It works, right? Well, maybe that's something else that we uh, need to be more focused on. I mentioned the fact that the real impact of incidents is not sufficiently visible, but for individual networks, I think the same goes for the Dutch government. What triggered the whole thing 
was IP, IP address space of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign <laughs> Affairs being hijacked. And that was a wake-up call, not a good one, obviously. But if tho those type of stories, right, we can demonstrate to people that not wait for something to break and then, oh, I'm going to spend a lot of money and, and get stressful and I need to repair it. No, no, you can actually, you know, implement this in quite a reasonably simple fashion and be prepared, you know. And again, your customer's going to benefit, your <laughs> yourself is going to benefit in the long run. But yeah, maybe we also need a bit, a bit more eff uh, effort in terms of maybe the shaming part or the, you know, the incidents that really had an impact and also have people you know, share those stories and what that led them then to, uh, to implement this. I don't know if that answers your question. Or yes, thank you. And I think when you mentioned the Middle East, th that perhaps an explanation is in place that the RIPE NCC as a, a regional internet registry is literally doing Iceland and Greenland even up to Vladivostok and a lot of the Middle East. They all provide the IP addresses for that region like AP Nick is doing here in uh, in Asia. Um, Sorry? Quick comment? Yeah, of course. So <coughs> just to build just a little bit on what Bastian was talking about, uh, there's been a sea change in the United States. This summer I had, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, a fairly surreal experience when I went into a government building for our uh, communications ministry, our Federal Communications Commission, these are the folks who regulate broadcast signals, and they also regulate mobile wireless signals. So quite powerful. All the wireless providers, lots of the uh, wireline providers, the cable companies, which a lot of the internet in the United States to all of our homes is. And it was kind of surreal because the United States government is now taking the position that routing is a matter of national security. And all of these people from like the FBI and the Department of Justice and all these law enforcement bureaucrats were getting up and talking about how we absolutely must secure the routing infrastructure of the United States of America against attacks, against misconfigurations, against hijacks. And not only were they talking about it in general terms, talking about the principles of security, they were mentioning, and these are elected people who were talking. They were saying things like RPKI and ROA. They were saying things like URPF. They were using acronyms that I didn't think a government bureaucrat knew how to spell. And I was like, where am I? What's going on here? But I loved it. It was great because it showed that a country, a large country, was taking seriously the need to adopt RPKI, the need to adopt validation of ROAs, at a national level. And they were going to use the power of the government to force the regulated parties to do this. And to answer your question, it's because for them it's national security. Because it's not just the mariners in their boats who are connected. It's the military. It's all of the government. Federal, state, local. It's our schools. Everything is online now. Thank you. I think that is a good example of changing the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> so, so th and that's perhaps what also what Bastian was saying. If uh, if people do not voluntarily, or if organizations not voluntarily do it, the government will stop, stop, step in at some point. But will they literally regulate and write laws, or will it still be a, a good discussion saying, guys, you really have to do this? But if then ten, five, even five years from now, nothing has happened, then probably it will become legislation, and is it something that that industry wants to avoid? I, sometimes, if I'm looking at it from a negative point of view, I get the idea that they want to be regulated because then there finally is a level playing field. And that is what missing, also missing here with the deployment of these standards, that if I deploy, it costs me money, meaning that I have to be have a higher price while the competition does not do it, and in other words, they may have more customers because of it. So that, that is one of the reasons that, that deployment on a voluntary basis may be hard. But if you don't want to regulate, then procurement, I can't say that enough, may actually change that. But the question then is why I are most governments not procuring secure by design? And it's a question I simply don't have the answer to. But the fact is that it doesn't happen as a standard. Um, what I would like to, to ask from the people present here and get your views anyway, 
Then I'm going to hand the mic over to Stonic with you, but then you can pass it through. What what do you actually take out yourself out of this session, and wha- and how could you change the discussion perhaps in your country? Where could you ask these sort of questions? Because then you get a, perhaps a little bit inspire inspiration in your own country to change this or this discussion. So I'm going to ask Anamik to pass the. And ask your your uh, yes, of course. If you would like to speak first, okay, of course. Please in, please introduce yourself first. Yeah. I'm actually Samira. So I have been living in Japan for about now two or three years. Just uh, for the remark that made, I mean, uh, why would a country be hijacked? I mean, that's what I I've like. For example, a targeted country is like U.S. Maybe they have like many enemies. I guess. So maybe, I'm not saying that they have. I mean, I'm just, uh, just assuming. For example, Israel, maybe, I'm not sure. But when it, when it comes to internet, I mean, uh, we, are com- we are going to the very core of uh, the procurement, the, the routing and switching and all this standardization. And so we, at the beginning also, we said, yeah, internet is it's similar for everyone. It's working well also, you said. But how we are going to regulate these regulations when it comes to the countries where they don't feel the need? For example, a normal country, which is, uh, of course, like, for example, we'll say Norway, very peaceful. They don't feel the need, I guess. So it, I think it is not that pretty much, uh, I, I think, uh, what it must be done is to regulate, but how well we will regulate when it comes to countries' individual legislation, how well we can force them to use these standards if they don't feel the need. I mean, one way where we can creep in is by the educating them, right? So I feel that uh, we need uh, to, to think uh, like in a, in a way that people attract, for example, if, if you say that uh, you're posting on something in social media, okay, so this can cause your life, it can be a threat to your life. Of course, they will listen to that, right? So it's similar. So I would think that it is, uh, it's a need of uh, the legislation, because US, is, U- US knows that they have like, they have hijackers, they have uh, people who wants to creep into their network. So I think. I mean, it's a good point. The thing is, <clears throat> it's not just about geopolitics. A lot of this is about people who want to exploit vulnerabilities to make money. And some are to create chaos. Again, not for geopolitical reasons. So one of the things that we have to do is ensure that everybody in the world in all countries, big and small, peaceful and not peaceful, understand that vulnerabilities create opportunities. And there will always be people who want to fill that opportunity for their own purposes. Yes, thank you. I think that that is a very good example of what we try to close as IS3C. We cannot do that ourselves, but we can hand over knowledge and tools to actually do that. And but then it's up to countries to to deploy. So my my question to you was to share with what you got out of this session and what could you do in your country to plant a little seed of knowledge on this topic. So start start up front and then go around. And please introduce yourself. Hello? Ah, okay. I'm Ryan. I'm I'm from Indonesia. I, it's a bit hard, I think, for my country because I when the session run, I just take three. I sampling two e-commerce in my country, and one of the legislation of websites through the internet.nl. All of them not sign it on the NSEC, <laughs> but the e-commerce is signed it on the RP, RPIC. I think the e-commerce uh, realize about the security. Uh, bridge to them, the the threat to them. Actually, in my country, as uh, 
Today I just meet our vice minister for the communication information. He just give a speech on the in the main hall. And I doesn't have any access to that high level. I hope with Netherlands we have a lot a long history, right? <laughs> Can you please <laughs> suggest something to our country to try to implement this? Because many of the decision maker is doesn't even aware about this thing. The procurement, everything, the tender is always about money. Not about the security, not about the people. It's always about the money. I hope I can, but even I think he doesn't know me. <laughs> yeah, but if possible, I hope my country will be getting better because next year we will have our presidential election, and there's a lot of issue with IT security, all of the fake information from the AI generative things, and many of people is like I cannot say, but many of them is doing anything to get to the position. So I hope everyone can help my country. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a quite clear call. Thank you for sharing. Uh, hi, uh, I'm I'm Masumi Nakamura from Japan, and uh, I'm a uh, really uh, beginner of this area. But uh, about the uh, DNSSEC, uh, uh, the rate of DNSSEC is low uh, either in Japan. But uh, the one uh, issue is. Uh, the uh, the open cylinders written in English, <laughs> so we have to translate to Japanese, and uh, we have to make more easier to read to the decision maker. So that's all uh, a problem. And uh, I am uh, uh, the uh, government officer, so uh, my colleagues are uh, trying hard on it, and <laughs> I, uh, I'm not uh, in the the position. But uh, if I have a chance to. Uh, I to get the reaction of the such that matter, uh, I will I will uh, I will try to make the thing better. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for also eye opening. Uh, I guess uh, it's not that uh, just targeting countries also, but just. Uh, making solutions for the vulner vulnerability. I think it is a, it's a wonderful point. So I guess uh, the key is for the, from, through the education. Uh, so I would like to also put myself forth and uh, s research more into these areas. I have, of course, my, my area is ERP systems. So, uh, so I, would, I would think uh, much more into learning this uh, these things that this lot of input there was a lot of input here, so I guess that education will drive into uh, the countries who are not aware of it. As we all know that internet is working, but underneath there can be uh, catastrophic events. Of course, when we just keep things open, so when we can close the door, why we just close it and lock it, right? So that's what I got from this session. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm Santosh Sigdal from Nepal. Uh, I'm executive director of Digital Rights Nepal. I joined the session in between, but uh, I liked it very much and it has opened a lot of question. In Nepal, we recently in early August, uh, Nepal adopted the national cyber security policy. A before that, we have Electronic Transaction Act, but now the government wants to bring a new cyber security law and for that they have adopted the national cyber security policy. One of the problematic aspect of the national cyber security policy, two of the <laughs> actually two of the problematic uh, area is uh, in the consultation phase, in the draft phase, there was no mention about the national internet gateway. Now the government is talking about installing a national internet gateway without defining it. And uh, this is uh, targeted for, they are saying that for the resilient and the secure internet. Uh, and another problematic area is they are also talking about the uh, government intranet. And the third, which is also related with the procurement part, is earlier it was not there in the draft uh, rule, but now they are proposing that the laws relating to procurement of the cyber uh, security or the ICT consultancy and the equipment will be defined by the government, and that could that could be out of the bound of the public procurement policy. 
So I think procurement here comes very, uh, this is a seri serious issue where the government wants to kind of put it behind the curtain or the procurement process, what kind of consultancies, what kind of ICT equipment are being procured. And the problem is uh, in the least developed countries like Nepal and others, uh, the stakeholders are not very much aware about the repercussion or the possible impact on other areas because of such kind of laws and policies. Uh, especially civil society organization and media, they are also not aware about it and uh, uh, the, it is evident from the kind of reports the civil society or the media, the public discourse we are having at the point at Nepal. So I think it is very important that we take these issues uh, into the public discourse and civil society organization has a kind of uh, very important role to make a stakeholder have a kind of uh, uh, informed discourse about the policy proposed, possible repercussion, and at the same time its impact on uh, the utility of internet, at the same time the other human rights that internet enables. So I think this is very important session and I have uh, gained a lot of insights which could be used for the public advocacy. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the, uh, this very, very useful session and very informative for me. And I'm from the uh, telecom carrier in Japan, and communications, and we are ISP, and so we need to implement the uh, many, many security DNSSEC or uh, RPK or something like that, but it needs a cost and so very <laughs> you know, difficult to improve. That's not possible, but I would like to, okay, inform uh, my company and tell this discussion and try to improve such kind of new technologies. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ichiro Mizukoshi from Japan. I'm just jumping in the middle of the session, so I'm not sure about the whole the discussion. But in my humble opinion, to secure the IOSD services is uh, maybe the subs subscription service will help it because uh, selling out the product, after the sale of the product, the uh, repairing vulnerability for the uh, product, product manufacturer, there's, um, it's hard for a long period, it's uh, too heavy, but if it was uh, pro uh, subscription services, they get their money to get services so they can, they can have a, a chance to uh, repair it. That's my opinion, yeah. So I'm Daisuke Kotani from Kyoto University. And uh, I'm a researcher, but partly I'm involved in the procurement of the university IT infrastructure. So from that perspective, the problem is the budget cost and the uh, so the skill set of the uh, engineers. So currently, so unfortunately, so if we request uh, outside company to support RPKI or DNSSEC, uh, but uh, if such company doesn't have enough engineer to uh, do uh, support, so, so we cannot uh, implement in our campus infrastructure. So uh, education to the engineer is, I think it's an uh, important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I literally thought I, I, I could um, skip it. Well, um, as I explained, um, in two weeks time, I'm gonna be up in Ottawa talking to a group of uh, sort of high level decision makers in the federal government. Um, certainly I think this conversation has, is going to help um, us design. We haven't actually designed a workshop yet. That was a task that is up to me and one of my co-authors um, once I'm back from Kyoto. And so this sh does give us a, a really good set of ideas to do it. So thank you. Finally, 
Um, thank you very much for all your stories and the input. Um, I would like to invite you uh, to control, to check your website or your email address to internet.nl. And if you score 100%, we give uh, you a position on the Hall of Fame. And we always uh, give a t-shirt, which is a very collector's item <laughs> in Holland. You can also sleep in it, eh? <laughs> you can jump. Um, and then you get a t-shirt. That's the way how we do it in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, tempting uh, organizations to uh, use those uh, open standards and get in the Hall of Fame. But uh, well, you can collect if you uh, like to try. You can uh, afterwards, uh, the session, you can check it in. Thank you. Thank you. Th and thank you all for sharing your, your ideas with us. And we're getting close to the end of this, this session. We have a few minutes left. But what I would like to, to, to say is that it seems like, from also what you've said, there is a literally a world to win. Because if we are able, to, if you are able to convince the people you work with that this is an important topic and use the right arguments, then probably things will change. And that is what we're going to strive for. What can you expect from IS3C? I think that the first thing I would like to do is to, to invite you to come to our session on Tuesday at 10.30 10 in working group J, this the one next to it here. What we will do there is present three reports. The first is a global comparison on, on policy, national policy on Internet of Things security. And just to tip that, give a very little hint, is that there isn't very much in a regulatory way to find. It's all voluntary. So that is one. The second that we'll, we'll be presenting is on procurement, as we already understood from the session today, is that it's also a global policy comparison showing what the level of procurement by governments is at this point in time. The third report is, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to present it because the lady who is supposed to give the presentation cancelled at the last moment and the report is not available yet, I understood. We made that together with the United Nations, with UNDESA, and the launch was not, well, not through, I understand, this August in somewhere in China, so it's not online yet, but we'll try and say something about it. We're also going to present a tool. The comply and uh, the comply and explain list is having a global translation, as you as you could call it. Is that a team of experts has come together and made a choice on three topics. One is on the categories of standards. The other is on the scope of the list, and the third one is the individual standards that go underneath this list. What is going to be announced is an open consultation. So anybody in the world who has an opinion on this, the scope, or on the categories, on the standards, is allowed to share their comments in a Google Doc so that we can make a more and better informed decision on what is going to be in this list. Next, we will have the presentation that David more or less gave to announce the working group on, on the narrative on DNSSEC and RPKI, and finally, we'll be announcing a working group on emerging technologies. So the idea is that in the coming year, we will be doing a global policy comparison on artificial intelligence and later, perhaps, on quantum computing and on the metaverse. But what we also do is try to see our, to our, re our relevance to the sustainable development goals. So how is the work that we are actually developing at this point in time able to, to make the world better as a whole and not, not just on, on the, the topic of internet standards? And what was happening in the other room that is stopping at this point also, almost, is that we have a short, short synapses of the cybersecurity hub and the plan that we have there. So, in other words, we'll be doing a lot of the, presenting a lot of the work that we've been doing in the past year. So you're 
invited to share that to come there. If you're interested in learning more of what we do, you can join through the IGF, IGF uh, website. If you go to the Dynamic Coalitions and look at the Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition, you can sign up for the email list and you will not get a million emails every day, but when we have a working group that is starting or have a, has a, its own meeting, you can get an invitation to join. And if you're interested to work with us, that's also an option that we look at for people who voluntarily are willing to chip in a little bit in, in this work. So we have our own website. That is the IS3, the number three, coalition org, and that's where we publish all our reports, and on the 10th, all the new reports will be able to be downloaded from, from there. So I think that that is all I want to say. I'm looking at the panel. Mark, have you made any observations that you would like to share with us from listening? And I haven't heard anybody online, so I think there's... Thank you, Vart. I've been following uh, on the, the Zoom link and online uh, no comments or um, reactions have come through uh, the chat room in the, in the Zoom link. Um, but I think the, uh, the key message from this session, I think, is very important, that procurement and supply chain management really do have major contributions to make in driving the adoption of critical uh, security-related standards and, and, and uh, routing uh, protocols and so on. So that's a very important message and I'd really appreciate uh, from me personally that um, there are comments here that uh, uh, that this is, you know, there's a lot of valuable information that the coalition IS3C is collating and uh, we need to build on that with more contributions and more experiences from other countries. And I'm thinking in particular from my own country, the UK, um, when I was working for the UK government, the issue of procurement, really, uh, of, of um, network services and equipment never really came up as an internal policy issue. But every now and again, there were these massive um, security um, failures online, which did get a lot of media coverage. But then again, you never hear the consequences of those data breaches, whether they affect the police forces, as was recently the case in Northern Ireland, or uh, financial services. You hear about these headline-grabbing incidents, but you never hear what the follow-on from what them was in terms of uh, ensuring that these things don't happen again. But I think this coalition does provide a channel for distributing that kind of important information. Anyway, those are my reflections uh, about back to you. Thank you, Mark. David, any last words? No? Then with that, I will let you go, and we'll be well in time for the people who come next to, to prepare. Thank you very much for your contributions and your insights, because that's something that we are going to take home. Um, thank you for all the technical uh, work. Thank you, Mark, for the online moderation. And with that, uh, I wish you a very good, uh, very good uh, IGF and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.